Hello, everybody, and a special welcome to Shoshana, um, who um, joins us uh, from her home in Maine today. Shoshana, welcome. Hello. Thank you so much. It's a great honor to be here. Well, I think the honor is on our side, but anyways, Shoshana, um, I read up on you again a little bit, and I, I, I found that you studied philosophy, first of all, then you got a, a PhD in social uh, psychology, if I'm, if I remember correctly, um, and and then very early on, you somehow got got into this field of IT and the consequences and effects of IT. How did this happen? How a, can a wonderful philosopher and social psychologist um, end up in IT? <laughs> well, you know, um, I understood uh, early, actually. Uh, 1978 was when I first um, had, you know, that that moment of insight that one sometimes gets that uh, it's like a curtain opens up and you can see into the future. That happened for me in, in 1978. And um, I had I had done my doctoral research uh, largely in, in Venezuela, in Caracas, um, in the Venezuelan telephone company <laughs> of all places. Um, and I was very interested in the, uh, the nature of work experience and how it influenced uh, how people thought and how their um, personalities developed and their, their human development in general and so forth. Anyway. And I was very interested in the history of work. Um, in fact, in, in the 1976, I wrote a paper called um, um, uh, the, it was on the, the history of work as a history of the social organization of attention. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. uh, a theme that is uh, kind of normal now, but in those days, uh, uh, much less so. Yeah. So um, I, I was uh, trying to support myself while I wrote my doctoral thesis and people, I had gotten a kind of reputation as someone who knew how to go into an organization and interview employees, interview workers and, uh, and think about, you know, what needed to be improved in that organization. And I actually had a, had a job interviewing linotype operators at the Washington Post. And um, as you know, uh, they were going through this uh, monumental transition from hot type to cold type. That's 1978. Anyway, long story short, uh, after spending several nights on the graveyard shift with the operators, I found myself wandering around Washington DC early one morning and I, I went into the National Gallery and I was um, looking at an, an exhibit of David Smith, the great sculptor, something called the Voltry, uh, uh, the Voltry series, where he had found these old um, um, industrial pieces of industrial equipment, industrial machinery that had been abandoned in old uh, workshops and, you know, in dusty abandoned Italian villages and so forth and turn them into extraordinary objects of contemplation. And I was alone one morning in the National Gallery in a white amphitheater on the top bleacher looking down at Voltry, at the Voltry uh, series. And I understood that what the linotype operators were going through and the many other people I had been interviewing in offices and shops and all kinds of places where they were undergoing computerization for the first time. Uh, I realized that this was a great structural transformation, that it was comparable to industrialization uh, and that it would change everything. And it all came to me in a flash. And uh, since that day in 1978, I have pers been pursuing uh, that one idea as it unfolds, uh, not only in my understanding, but in the real world that we're all sharing. Uh, and that has been uh, 42 years of my life. So um, would you say that, you know, starting from this epiphany, 
um, today is, is, is the time. Today is the time when the public actually responds to what you have to say at a larger scale. There's, there's no question. I mean, for so many years, I felt like I was shouting underwater. You know that feeling? <laughs> it's, um, it, there, I haven't I think tried a, it, but, but <laughs> I believe it's hard. I think there's a standard nightmare that most people have had at one time or another, you know, where you're, you're screaming in your dream and there's no sound coming out. <laughs> um, um, I, I've felt that way for most of my career. And I will say that um, these days uh, I do feel like, uh, you know, the, all of us sort of almost at the same time, we've taken the earplugs out of our ears. And I feel that um, people all over the world are beginning to grasp and to hear and, and to pay attention to their own experience. So that now my words are not just uh, what Zuboff says, but my words are helping them make sense of what we all feel. Uh, but we, when we don't have words, when we don't have language to, to uh, express it, uh, to get our, our, our minds around it, it, you know, it makes it so, so difficult to think and to move forward. So well, yes, the, a the sea word, chain. The, the, the word, the most prominent word that you gave us now, right now is that uh, the term surveillance capitalism, meaning that, that especially the, the big internet companies, um, really are, are the big brother of our day um, and use all of our sort of daily experience and, um, and, and turn it into, um, into personal products. Um, did, did you see this, this type of problem already arising early on? I mean, you know, the Googles and Facebooks of this world were given birth at around the turn of the century. Is this the fulfillment of your, of your worst nightmares? Well, it, it's actually, um, you know, I, I wrote about, um, it was back in, um, well, my first book, In the Age of the Smart Machine, The Future of Work and Power, was published in 1988. And it was there that I first wrote about what I called the information panopticon. And I, um, I observed that essentially any time we have, um, we have uh, digitally produced information. Um, if there are no rules or laws or sanctions to govern its use, that it will inevitably be used for surveillance and control. I call that Zuboff's third law. Uh, any digital information that can be used for surveillance and control will be used for surveillance and control in the absence of countervailing uh, rules, laws, and sanctions. Well, back then, I still hadn't fully understood the kind of power that would emerge from these new conditions. And that power, it turns out, and this is important to, to say because, um, because you know, we're, we're, this conversation is convened by a group of um, of um, auspicious German news organizations. And it's very important that we understand that this power is not big brother. This is not a totalitarian power. It's a new kind of power that is unique to our time. I've called it instrumentarian power because it works through the medium of digital instrumentation. It works through systems and infrastructures, digital systems and infrastructures, and it can accomplish great things. By great, I don't mean wonderful, I mean enormous. <laughs> I mean, it can shift uh, and shape human behavior at the individual level and at the collective level. It can make us uh, read things, join, join groups, believe things and act in ways that we would not otherwise have done. But it does it without ever coming to our homes in the dark of night to drag us to the gulag or the camp. It never threatens us with violence. It does it without a single gun. One tiny example, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop, but 
We now know, for example, that the 2016 Trump uh, presidential campaign, uh, it, it was a huge political advertiser on Facebook. It used all of Facebook's capabilities. I think of it as uh, political advertising is a way to rent surveillance capitalism for a political campaign and simply pivot all of its capabilities a few degrees from commercial objectives to political objectives. In the case of the Trump 2016 campaign, they used all of Facebook's capabilities to influence black citizens in swing states uh, to refrain from going to the polls on election day, to refrain from voting. They were segmented as people who could be deterred from voting. They were psychologically targeted. They were targeted with subliminal cues. They were targeted with uh, engineered social comparison dynamics. So they were manipulated based on huge data sets of information about these folks. They had their personality profiles, their um, sexual proclivities, their uh, political profiles. They knew everything about these folks, which is normal in Facebook. That's how it works. Uh, and they use this to get people to um, give up their own democratic right, the most fundamental right we have as, as democratic citizens. So this is instrumentarian power. They were able to affect the vote without ever showing up at anybody's house to threaten murder or violence or draw a gun. That's how it works. Um, do you think that the founders of the big digital platforms via via those, you know, most of what you say is taking place, that they, um, even though they said that they don't want to do any evil in the case of Google, actually understand what they're doing, understand that they are the, the new dominators in this digital world and that they influence us in ways which you find unethical. Yes, <laughs> of course. Um, yes. And so are they, are they like the rubber barons? Are they bad people in that sense? Are they greedy people? Or I mean, do you interact with them in that way? How, how are we supposed to, to make sense of these, you know, partly sympathetic guys and girls? Well, look, uh, I mean, there are a variety of ways to make sense. Number one, they stumbled into an economic logic, surveillance capitalism, which turned out to be um, uh, the economic paradigm of our time. It, it, may I explain that uh, just very, very briefly? Of, of yes, how that I works? mean our, our time ref, our time frame here is ridiculous, but we we're trying to do our best. Yes. Please. All right. Well, I'm I'm going to try and do this in just a couple of sentences. Uh, capitalism evolves by claiming things that live outside the market dynamic, bringing them into the market dynamic, turning them into commodities, things that can be sold and purchased. We know famously <laughs> over the course of a couple of centuries, this is what industrialization did. Industrial capitalism claimed the rivers and the meadows and the mountainsides as commodities for sale and purchase. Now it's land, it's real estate. Uh, this is what drove uh, the, um, the whole momentum of industrial capitalism. Uh, now, Fast forward to the early 21st century, we have these um, baby internet companies. They're uh, doing all sorts of neat things, but they're not making money and they don't know how to make money. And it was then at Google in the years 2000, 2001, they had a breakthrough when they realized that human generated data, our personal information could be their new virgin wood. It could be the, uh, the, the, uh, the whole new domain that had nothing to do with the marketplace that could be brought into the marketplace and turned into commodity and made their private property. So the upshot was they claimed our private human experience as a source of, remater uh, a source of raw material mm -hmm. to translate into behavioral data. 
and those behavioral data would be used for their commercial purposes. As soon as they translate our experience into behavioral data, they claim those behavioral data as their private property. They own it. Then it goes into their computational factories. It's turned into products. They sell those products and those uh, sales are the basis of their entire market capitalization. The point is that this is an illegitimate logic that is essentially based on stealing because they took something from us without asking. They did it in a way that bypassed our awareness and therefore our right to contest and to combat. And therefore the whole edifice is built on this uh, shaky bed of sand. So they are, to get back to your original question, are these bad people or how do we understand this? They are compelled to defend an economic logic that is fundamentally illegitimate. Mm -hmm. And in that defense, as we have seen, they will go to any length because now there are trillions and trillions of dollars at stake. That's not something that is easily going to be given up. There's also immense social power at stake. And as we know in the historical annals of the human species, there aren't many times when people who have great power voluntarily give up great power. Yes, um, definitely. I couldn't, I couldn't give you too many counterexamples for that, I have to admit. Um, um, Shoshana, uh, Europe um, sometimes to its dismay doesn't, doesn't have these types of platforms, at least not at a large scale. Um, which in a way could give it an advantage. And sometimes it's said that Europe could be in the digital world, the third way between the US and China. Um, do you see us evolving that way? And, and if so, where do we stand? Well, right now, Europe has every opportunity to become the hero in this so far relatively dark story. And uh, I, for one, am counting on Europe uh, to forge this path. Right now, um, we have leadership in the European Commission that is on record as saying democratic law must prevail. For the last two decades, democratic law stops at the cyber border. But European leadership has said that that is not tolerable that the fundamental rights of uh, citizens in the European Union uh, must not stop at the cyber border, that the laws that govern life in the analog world must govern life in every domain. Um, this is a critically important commitment that European leaders are making right now, but they're also going beyond uh, the principle to uh, real new legislative action. And in the Digital Services Act and in the Digital Markets Act, which are now before the EU parliament, we have the basis for building a bridge from this 20 years of a, of a void that has been filled by surveillance capitalism and its rules, its economic laws and its power uh, to retake that void and fill it with democratic law and democratic institutions. These new legislative frameworks build the bridges between this um, recent past of absolutist private capital, private market power, and a digital future that is reclaimed for democracy, for a thriving and flourishing democratic digital future. So the European Parliament right now is facing an enormous historic opportunity. Um, and I think we have to go back to the late 19th and early 20th centuries to find any kind of parallel. You know, when we were codifying workers' rights and consumers' rights and, and those grand legislative frameworks that made the industrial era safe for democracy, I think that really is the, the only comparison we can draw here with the historic importance of what the European uh, Parliament uh, 
can accomplish for Europe and for all the citizens of the world right now. Is, do you think Europe is discussing the right types of steps? I mean, for example, um, a lot of attention is focused on, on the question of, of antitrust law, new antitrust law, and the breakup of, of the big platforms. Um, do you think that's a, an, an important way to go? Well, look, there's, there's a lot of confusion on the following point. <laughs> When we're talking about the, the huge surveillance capitalists, Facebook, Google, Amazon, um, to a certain extent, Microsoft, and even to a certain extent, Apple, uh, although that is a, a confounding and, and complex um, situation. I'm just talking about the giants here. Uh, there are many other very, very big companies in this mix, many other uh, complex ecosystems of medium and, and small companies, as well as every app, but we don't have to get into all of that. The point is that when we're talking about these big companies, especially, they are ruthless capitalists, as well as being ruthless surveillance capitalists. So when we talk about antitrust and competitive harms that eliminate competition in key market domains, do they do that? Yes, absolutely. Um, are there antitrust solutions that can mitigate a great deal of those anti-competitive practices? Yes, absolutely. Will that alter and transform surveillance capitalism? No. Okay, then let that's, me, let me step that's right. where the that's where I, the issue is. Yes. Let sorry. me step uh, because of the time. As I said, our ridiculous time frame. Um, let me step in right here and, and ask you if this is not what stops. Um, what you describe as surveillance capitalism, what is, what would be? The first thing is that, as I said before, the whole edifice is built on a bed of sand. We need to make their extraction, that fundamental step that I described to you where they take our experience, turn it into data, and then that's their private property. That makes them ex extractors of massive scale. And that extraction is fundamentally illegitimate. They have no right to my private experience. They have no right to my face. So they have we, no right to post, my- Sorry, but should we forbid this then? Should we, should we by law make this an, an illegal activity? A century ago, we didn't have workers' rights. Yeah. And once we had workers' rights, the whole landscape changed. Today, we don't have what I call the epistemic rights, the rights that should accrue to each individual by virtue of our citizenship in a democracy, the rights to be the people who, um, who uh, control ownership of uh, knowledge about our own lives, the right to know my own private life is my right. And I decide what is shared. I decide how it is shared with whom and for what purpose. My epistemic rights, my rights to know my own life mean that I can choose privacy when I want to. Privacy is an effect. Epistemic rights are the cause. We need charters of epistemic rights that relocate Uh, control over our private experience and all the knowledge and all the data derived from it back under the auspices of individuals who are protected by fundamental rights under the rule of law overseen by democratic institutions. This, right. So that's extraction. We take aim at that. Once we do that, we have the tools to go after the operations the algorithmic operations that drive information chaos, disinformation, misinformation that are destroying our democracy. And we have the tools to go after these markets where they sell products about us, the information products, the predictions of our behavior that are now sold into these unique new kinds of markets that trade in the commodity of human futures 
we can go after those financial incentives and interrupt them and even outlaw those kinds of markets because they are predictably dangerous to individuals and to democracy. So once we get a handle on extraction, it gives us the basis for tackling all of the harms which are destroying society and destroying democracy. So basically we are in, if, even if we do it right, we're in for a long process, for a long fight, if, if, if you want. Um, and not unlike the, the labor movement um, 100 or more years ago. Um, I, I, they're, they're, uh, well, I, I would, I would uh, simply uh, add there that uh, time is accelerated for many reasons and uh, including in our talk this morning, and we have the opportunity to achieve these things that I'm talking about. Uh, I don't, it, it cannot take multiple decades. We have to take a stand and shift the trajectory right now in this third decade of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. If we don't act in this decade, finding our way back to a democratic starting point is going to be far more difficult. So there yeah. is urgency, but there also is, as you said at the beginning, a growing recognition of the importance and the uh, a shared sense of urgency in Europe and indeed in many countries around the world, including in my own country. Um, I take time that we don't have for one last question with, a, with begging for a quick answer. Um, and that question comes from one of our viewers. Um, and she says, aren't people quite happy with what the platforms are offering? And isn't that the major difficulty in, in overcoming um, surveillance capitalism? Well, you know, the problem is that people are happy as long as they're ignorant. <laughs> and, the, you know, this is found in every piece of research going back to the very beginning of the 21st century. When you actually expose people to what's going on behind the scenes, inevitably the reaction is, I want no part of it. How do I hide from it? How do I get to an alternative? Um, an immense amount of capital has gone into making these systems hidden, camouflaging these systems, making sure that we don't understand how much data they are taking from us and how they are using it. As in that example I gave you of a 2016 Trump campaign. So uh, when you expose people to the truth, people are horrified. Right now, when you actually look at the, at the survey results, the attitude surveys, certainly in the United States, which has been slow to come to this party, much slower than Europe, in the United States, there is a complete rupture of faith with the tech companies. We're seeing now in the data uh, percentiles in the 70, 80, uh, and 90th percentiles, majorities who say this is intolerable, they have too much power, they have to be stopped, we don't trust them, they're making more problems than they're solving, they're destroying society, they're destroying democracy. As, as We've we never said, had that before. As we said at the beginning, time is um, moving your way. Um, unfortunately, our time is more than up. Um, you luckily are going to continue talking in the next discussion round. Um, I have to stop talking. Shoshana, thank you so much. And um, here's uh, Ina Karabas and, and Christine Rau um, for moderating again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Delighted to have you uh, back in uh, just a minute. Uh, before that, we're going to switch back into German because wir haben eine Umfrage gemacht, äh, die wir gerne mit Ihnen teilen möchten. Und in dieser Umfrage, die wir vor diesem Event Europe 2021 gestellt haben, ähm, ist die Frage gewesen, ist die Demokratie Ihrer Meinung nach in Deutschland gefährdet? Und die Ergebnisse finde ich ganz spannend. Ja, die sehen wir nämlich hier auf unserem ähm, Monitor. Und also mich haben sie überrascht und auch gleichzeitig ein bisschen erschreckt, weil äh, 45,9 Prozent sagten ja, auf jeden Fall oder eher ja. Also 
Das ist schon eine ganze Menge. 44,2 Prozent sagten, nein, sie sehen die Demokratie in Deutschland nicht als gefährdet an oder auf keinen Fall als gefährdet an. Also wir haben im Vorfeld auch schon mal kurz darüber gesprochen. Ich fand das ein sehr überraschendes Ergebnis, weil ich doch gedacht habe, dass es mehr Vertrauen in die Demokratie hier in Deutschland gibt. Genau, und die Diskussion, die wir zwei äh, dann geführt haben, war, dass ich tatsächlich weniger überrascht davon war, weil ich das Gefühl hatte, ähm, dass alles, was gerade passiert ist in, ähm, in der Welt, das, was wir gesehen haben, und ich meine jetzt nicht nur äh, in den USA also, oder in, äh, in Myanmar zum Beispiel, sondern durchaus auch in Europa, die Wahlen, die wir äh, gewählt haben hier selber, die wir demokratisch gewählt haben, waren keine, die ausschließlich, sagen wir mal, Parteien zu, zugrunde kamen, die grunddemokratisch waren. Du spielst jetzt wahrscheinlich auch darauf an, dass die AfD bei uns im äh, Deutschen Bundestag sitzt. Da muss ich aber sagen, nur die Tatsache, dass die AfD im Deutschen Bundestag sitzt, das stellt jetzt mein Verständnis von Demokratie eigentlich überhaupt nicht in Frage, weil ja Wahl eigentlich der Kern der Demokratie ist. Und solange eine Partei nicht verboten ist, ist sie eben auch erlaubt, sie zu wählen. Also ob uns das passt oder nicht. Ja, ja, das ist richtig, genau. Und deswegen finde ich auch, dass die, die AfD ist nur ein Beispiel dafür, dass ähm, dass sie vielleicht Leute gewählt haben, die kein grundsätzliches Vertrauen vielleicht auch in die Demokratie haben, weil die gesagt haben, alles das, was wir vorher gemacht haben, ist nicht richtig. Ähm, ich sehe das aber vielmehr dann tatsächlich am Beispiel der USA. Auch Donald Trump ist demokratisch gewählt worden. Das, was wir hinter, hinten raus gesehen haben, ähm, war dann eben äh, ein weniger demokratischer Schritt. Und wir haben es auch in Deutschland gesehen, dass äh, Menschen versucht haben, auf den Reichstag äh, vorzudringen, ähm, da Fotos gemacht haben, die sie nicht hätten machen sollen. Und, ähm, und ich glaube tatsächlich, die meisten Menschen, selbst wenn wir in der deutschen Geschichte zurückgucken, ähm, die äh, sind demokratisch gewählt worden und haben dann auch zum Beispiel, wenn man vielleicht in den Osten schaut, äh, nach Russland zum Beispiel, die sind, also sind auch viele, die, die wir als wenig demokratisch beschreiben, demokratisch gewählt worden. Und deswegen ist es aber trotzdem, ähm, ich habe das Gefühl, wir sehen es mehr und mehr und deswegen äh, habe ich nicht mehr so ein starkes Vertrauen in die Demokratie wie vorher. Und ich muss aber sagen, das heißt jetzt nicht, dass wir es sein lassen sollten, im Gegenteil, dass wir stärker dafür, dafür kämpfen müssen. Ich glaube, bevor wir uns jetzt hier noch weiter die Köpfe heiß diskutieren, ich hätte da nämlich auch noch ein paar Takte dazu zu sagen, aber können wir ja gleich hinter der Kulisse machen, ja. geben wir nämlich ab zum nächsten Panel, wo Sie auch noch mal Shoshana Zuboff sehen werden, aber auch Katharina Barley, äh, die für die SPD im Europaparlament sitzt, Sascha Havlicek vom Institute of Strategy Dialogue und moderiert wird das Panel von der Wirtschaftswoche-Korrespondentin in Brüssel, Silke Wettach. Gute Unterhaltung, kann man das so sagen? Genau, und wir gehen <lacht> diskutieren. Viel, viel Erfolg. Yeah, thank you very much, Christian. Um, I'll switch back to English because we've got an international panel here. I'm delighted to, to have you for some more minutes, Shoshana. I know this is a, a huge topic. Uh, we could spend hours on it. Uh, so thank you for joining us again. Thank you, Katharina, for joining us from Brussels. Thank you, uh, Sasha. Um, before we start um, the discussion, uh, I just wanted to share uh, a personal experience I had last week. I was in Germany emptying my late parents' house and I kept getting ads for a hearing aid. And I couldn't quite figure out why it was because I was logging onto my computer. I never get these uh, ads back at home, but I think it really proved the point uh, Shoshana has been making. Data is just extracted from us everywhere. And unless we do something about it, and not we as individuals do something about it, uh, the big corporations are going to continue with that practice. Uh, so I'd like to have a proper look uh, first uh, at the threats uh, democracy and the rule of law are facing at the moment, before we go to remedies and solutions. Shazana has already mentioned that the EU is quite active on this. So uh, it's worthwhile to have a closer look. Uh, I'd start, I'd like to start with uh, Katharina Barley, Vice President of the European Parliament, um, also a former Minister of Justice. How big do you think, from your personal experience, how big a threat is technology really for democracy at this point in time? Well, thank you very much for the invitation first and, and for the honor to be with all these interesting women and having an all-female panel on this. I mean, this is really something unusual uh, concerning this topic also. Um, I think, indeed, um, there is a huge uh, danger for democracy. 
And um, uh, Shoshana has, has touched upon a lot of issues, uh, but there are still more to mention. I, I would just like to, to say uh, the deep fakes, for example, that we are seeing. We have manipulated videos where, where you really believe that Angela Merkel is resigning, for example, or that, um, I don't know, uh, whatever you, you want to imagine. So you can, you can actually cause a, a, an outrage um, by something where you in the past thought this is, this has to be real. It is, I mean, you, you see someone saying it. So, so how can you doubt it? So um, we have all these different aspects. We have these big tech companies gathering all sorts of data. We have uh, misinformation. We have, um, we have these, these uh, technical manipulations. So we, we, we are in, um, in danger because people, um, few people know very much about everyone and are able to manipulate. And the, the people who are willing to inform themselves are not able or will be able less and less um, to, to inform themselves um, in, a, in a way that they can rely on something. So, so I think there are threats from, and these are, these are just two, two sides of the medal. I'm, I'm sure there are more, um, even more threats to democracy. So yes, I think uh, we, have, we have a lot of issues uh, that we have to deal with. Thank you very much. Sasha, you are the founding CEO of a think tank that looks at all these dangers, um, but also at the interlinkages. You don't look at isolated points, but you have a pretty good overview. I think this leads directly to the question. Did you see the storm on the capital? Did you see this coming? Was this apparent in the data you're analyzing and your colleagues, you're looking at it day to day? Thank you so much, Silke. It's wonderful to be here with you. I mean, the short answer is yes. Um, if there were ever a more uh, visible, jarring and extraordinary challenge to a mature democratic process, um, I can't think of one in recent history. Um, it was shocking, but for those of us studying um, the online information ecosystem, uh, it wasn't a surprise. And that wasn't just because of the extraordinary and heightened levels of weaponized hate, of conspiracy, of extremism, of disinformation that we monitored across the open and closed parts of the web uh, over the past year, um, including one of the longer standing uh, and most, I suppose, successful disinformation voter fraud disinformation campaigns that we've seen in an electoral context. Um, but it's also because of the longer transformation, if you like, in the organizational dynamics, in the communications tactics of an array of bad actors that we've watched really over the last decade go essentially unchallenged. Uh, and so it wasn't a surprise. And the question I think that we need to be asking ourselves um, is how, uh, how quickly do we need to solve this before this becomes a systemic, perhaps an existential challenge for us here in Europe? Um, of course, we have policies afoot um, that I think are encouraging. Uh, but I think the thing that I took away from this was the, I suppose the interconnection of three things, as I mentioned, this sort of transform, this transformation, the coalescence of and aligning at a sort of unprecedented level of um, a whole array of bad actors, combined with a kind of hypercharging, um, a result of the, if you like, the technological architecture of the platforms Shoshana's talked about. That, that massive amplification, if you like, of content that comes closest uh, to the red line of extreme messaging. And, and ultimately a kind of information ecosystem segregation that we've seen happen over the last um, five years in particular. And, and that's reflected both on and offline. Thank you very much. I mean, I'm going to ask you, how quickly do we need to act? You asked the question, <laughs> do you have an answer to that? I think Shoshana said just at the end, you know, how everything is speeding up. We have to act extremely quickly um, because uh, where I think there have been doubts, certainly, you know, in our research, for instance, of 
extremism and terrorism, let's say five, six years ago, it was hard actually to convince many policymakers that there was in fact a correlation between online activity and offline real world action. I think that that penny now has dropped when we see that the scale of the impact, let's say of COVID disinformation and anti-vax disinformation, if we see the very real impact that um, the dis electoral disinformation has had in this, in this recent election, I think that penny has dropped. So what we do know is that self-regulatory attempts to date, be they in a European context and in an international context, have, have fallen short. And I think that penny has dropped. Because and otherwise... I think that penny has also dropped fundamentally within certain contexts, but perhaps not in all. And I, I think we're yet to see what happens with the new administration in the United States. I think there is optimism that um, there will be a, an openness for transatlantic engagement around this policy and regulatory um, space in a way that perhaps wasn't there before. Um, but time is of the essence, there is no question. Thank you very much. So Janet, one, one thing we've seen uh, on Capitol Hill is even if you act, there is a consequence. Some of the networks were closed down and then you realize police uh, find it far more difficult actually to trace those activities because people go to the dark net. So is this a race that could ever be won? Well, uh, look, um... <laughs> I think the, the one word that's missing so far from this conversation is the word economics. Uh, because everything that we're talking about, all of the harms that we're talking about, uh, and they are harms that are destructive to democracy and to the very fabric of society. Uh, but these harms are being produced by an economic logic. It's not the way technology works or it's not the way algorithms work. It's that when you walk onto a Facebook platform or when you walk into a Google platform or an Amazon platform, you're not walking into some open space, you know, like, a, like you're standing on the beach looking out the ocean and the beautiful horizon. It's the opposite of that. It's like, imagine you're walking into a rainforest if, if you've ever seen a rainforest, you know how scary that is. I mean, because it's so dense and everything is alive and pulsating and, and it's, and it's uh, almost impossible to make your way through. You know, picture yourself with a machete chopping your way through. But what you're walking through are economic imperatives and you're walking through the mechanisms and methods, the algorithms the whole range of targeting mechanisms um, that are algorithmically programmed. And uh, so there is no free space. You are walking through a private space that is completely institutionalized by private surveillance capital. And you are uh, hacking your way uh, through the density of its imperatives. So. One of, the, one of the key things to know about this space is that it is indifferent to truth. It, it's it's, an, it's the, 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 the main operation that drives the economics is extraction, the extraction of human generated data, which is then claimed as proprietary as the private property of the companies doing the extraction, the Facebooks, the Googles, et cetera, et cetera. And um, uh, behind this abstraction is the imperative for scale. None of the targeting works. You can't get the algorithms to do the things you want to do. You can't create the deep fakes or the, um, the algorithmic uh, um, uh, amplification that Sasha's organization has brought to the public uh, awareness um, with such uh, tremendous um, focus and, and, uh, and insight and competence, um, you can't do any of that without data at scale. So part of what that means is the machines are taking in uh, every kind of data they can, but they are formally indifferent to the meaning of the data. 
They're formally indifferent to its truth value. All data are, are regarded as equivalent, even though they are not equal. So, um, and in fact, there's a great line from, from Eric Schmidt, 2017, I don't know if you remember this, um, but he was being confronted in 2017, kind of in that period after the 2016 elections, but before Cambridge Analytica. And he was being confronted by journalists about how their algorithm, how their algorithms work, and uh, are doing some of these pernicious things that that Sasha and her team has written about, and um, and so he's sort of defending the algorithm, and he says, um, you know, when it comes to algorithms and uh, the search engine, quote, there is a line that we really cannot get across it is very difficult for us to understand truth. So just think about this for a minute. You know, here is um, essentially a, a trillion dollar market cap uh, corporation, the largest data company arguably ever existing on planet earth. Its stated mission is to organize and make accessible the world's uh, information, and it cannot, not that it will not, it cannot tell the difference between a truth and a lie. And this failing, not only does it not impede Google's success, but it is actually essential for Google's success. So this is the world that we're living in, and it's an economic world. So the interventions have to be lawful interventions. We, we need the laws to intervene on this. We need the charters of rights to protect us from this. And then I think we can make a lot of change pretty quickly. And those deep fakes become things that uh, we can outlaw and we can, uh, uh, crank up the engineering to be able to find them and discern them and, uh, and uh, make sure that they're not published. And that's getting harder and harder and it is an arms race. But right now, uh, democracy is not in the race and that's where we have to be. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, you, you've been very optimistic about what Europe is trying to do earlier on. You, you, you were saying this is, this is the right way to go. Uh, Katerina Barley, um, Commissioner Breton, after the storm uh, on Capitol Hill, was saying this couldn't have happened if the Digital Services Act were already in place. Um, do you agree? And how will it work? I mean, you, you're currently working on it at the European Parliament. How could it actually prevent a repetition of this in Europe? Um, well, the Digital Services Act um, is, is supposed to hold the big tech giants uh, more liable than they are at the moment for, for their content. And um, um, But at the same time, if I refer to what Shoshana just said, um, at the same time, um, actually does not... Um, does not uh, form a an, an obligation for the uh, for the tech uh, companies to to delete uh, content. It's it's about it's very much about uh, transparency. It's about knowing who, um, for example, has put money on on some news or advertisement or whatever you are seeing. It's about um, it's about making the audience more capable to understand what is happening and to take it into account. But we, at least in Europe, and I think in the US it might be even worse, we have very much this discussion about um, trying to protect individuals and censorship. I mean, this has been, we've had that, uh, Germany is at the forefront, I think even within Europe, we've had domestic um, national laws that are going further than what we see in most other European countries when it concerns um, hate speech, for example, or, or criminal offences um, in the in the internet, on the social platforms, and I mean this this discussion, this political discussion was huge. We've had we've had demonstrations in the streets with with thousands and thousands of people um, telling 
us not to censor um, positions and 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 personal views and and I think this is politically speaking as a as a political actor, this is the difficulty that we are facing because of course there are there are positions where you can distinguish very well between between a lie and truth, but there are very many positions where it's kind of I mean nobody really knows taking this this vaccination thing for example i mean usually vaccinations do have side effects yes they do almost every vaccination does and uh, take the measles for example they have very severe side effects but very rarely so one in 3 million really has uh, just roughly i'm not a medical expert um has a very severe um uh, 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 complications. So, and, and others have a lighter ones. And now, if you talk about a vaccination being safe or not, um, can you say uh, this vac vaccination is uh, threatens your your uh, health? Um, if you have one in three million, one in five hundred thousand, one in 2000 who have severe side effects you know this is something where it is very difficult to say yes or no and um this is for us who are who are trying to regulate um the 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 challenge number one i would say um and and the the questions that the question or one question that lies behind it is also who is the one to judge because I am from a generation where we fought against the state being the one to, to, um, to capture your data. I mean, we had this very, I think it was in 80, 84 or something like that. We had a judgment by our, by our constitutional court when it came to, um, to a public uh, collection of data of everyone. You know, everyone was handed out still on paper. Um, a, a, um, a sheet where you had to fill in who you are, how many, not, no, not who you are, and anonymously, how many children you have, et cetera, et cetera, just to have the data. You do that every, every I don't know, decade as a state. Um, and there was a huge outrage, and we had, a, we had a, um, a successful lawsuit against this because people thought you as a state were not supposed to to um, to get into this, uh, to have personal data, too much personal data of your citizens, which I agree upon still. Now, now, now we are at a point where, where young people, um, net activists addressed me when I was still a minister in charge, um, saying, you know, actually the state, you should set up a public Google. You, set, you should set up a public Facebook because the only way that we can get these, these, these interests, these economic interests out of that and still have the freedom of the internet is to have it in the hands of the state. And I was like, what? <laughs> I mean, this is, this is, uh, is, that, is, that really, is that really the solution? And these were experts. I mean, these were very, very bright people who, who proposed that. And, um, but, but, I'm, I'm really, I'm really very curious. I have two, these two very interesting uh, scientists with me on the panel. I'm, I'm, for me, this is the key conflict that we have. Um, are we, as 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 public, as policymakers, are we the ones to, in the end, um, define how to judge between truth and and lies? Are we the one who, to to give this competence to someone else. This is also in the discussion to give it to civil society, for example. Um, the legitimacy to judge upon this, that is the, I mean, we can't just have Twitter delete um, delete accounts like that. I think we, we all agree on this. We have to have rules for that. But that is, that is really, and we can't have the courts because, I mean, I used to be a judge myself, we have, I don't know how many thousand judges in, in, in Germany, you can't have them control the internet. The, this is absolutely impossible. So, so this, this is the question that I think is, is, is one, one of the keys. One of your fellow MEPs made the point after Trump was silenced by Twitter, how about Twitter starting to silence 
commissioners who come up with unpleasant uh, proposals. So, so very fair point. I'm going to pass it on uh, to the other two panelists. Uh, Sasha, who should be the referee? I mean, it's a really, it's a really interesting um, conversation, and and the point that uh, you've raised about the kind of trade-off between free speech and censorship at the heart of this debate is is an important one. Um, but I think it's largely misrepresented, and and I and I think that in part the companies have gotten behind that misrepresentation because it serves their ends quite well. We, you know, what we actually see is. The, the distortion of the information ecosystem by these platforms. This isn't actually a free speech environment. It's a distortive environment of speech. You talked about, I mean, Shoshana talked a little bit about, in a way, the agnostic dynamics of the platforms. They are indeed agnostic to content, but they're not content neutral. So I just give you a couple of bits of data from, from others in our research, starting with Facebook's own research, which was leaked uh, a couple of years ago from 2016, that found that 64% of all extremist group joins are due to their own recommendations algorithm. Our own research on Holocaust denial content showed that that content was still being recommended to users. It wasn't um, that we had to go searching, but it came to us, if you like. The disproportionate breakthrough that we've seen now um, and engagement rates with disinformation, number one in relation to COVID. So we, we did an analysis of um, disinformation, COVID disinformation versus the reach and engagement rates around, let's say the WHO's website, their information. The WHO's uh, content was reaching on Facebook and engaging with some 6 million people. The, the disinformation that we were tracking was reaching in the order of six of 80 plus million people and engaging with that number. Similarly, just now with this with this vote fraud um, disinformation and that that you know the, the alleged vote fraud uh, voter fraud uh, content, we saw that content reaching double the amount, engaging with double the amount of people on Facebook than. Um, the sort of best performing content um, that was denying such allegations. So you see a sort of systems problem here. And where I think we need to head is beyond content approaches to policy and regulation. We need to get to the systems approach. And I think this is where the DSA actually takes extraordinary steps forward. Transparency is absolutely critical, but that transparency has to be regulated, it has to be computational. And, and we believe it needs to be a transparency that's regulated across um, not just the algorithmic dynamics that we've just talked about, but the policies, the processes, the outcomes. We need to have visibility of those processes, those, those policies and those outcomes in relation to these very important things that the companies do, in relation to content moderation and redress, in relation to advertising, and in relation to those systems and architecture, the algorithmic piece. There are examples from other sectors, the financial services sector around algorithmic audit um, that I think um, you know, give us a sense of, of, of how this can be done. It is something that is doable, but we need now to move towards that systems-based approach because it deals with your question, Silke. Who, who gets to decide what's true and false? Nobody. What we should be deciding on um, is access to the data that gives us an, un an understanding of how the information ecosystem is being distorted and what the public health, safety, security um, uh, outcomes of that distortion are. On the basis of that data, on the basis of that, that transparency, then we can start to make decisions um, in full view of that information, which by the way, nobody has today. Nobody has that access, neither governments, nor indeed civil society, nor researchers, nobody has that access. Then we can start to make informed decisions within liberal democracies where we debate how we address those societal outcomes of the design of the architecture of these platforms. If I understand that correctly, you need a lot of transparency to make yes. a bit of a, a, a good decision and to have a, a full picture. 
of what's and, going. And you, and you need an audience that wants to be informed. I think this is also part of the problem. Um, may, I, may I, Zuka, may I just yeah. add a question to the, to the other two panelists? Yes. Um, because quite already, I don't know, three years ago, I, I, um, I asked for something and I, I was criticized very heavily for it, but I still think it is true. If we install something that, um, that ensures plurality, kind of a plurality obligation to, um, to oblige the companies to, to design their algorithms in a way that you do not well, you, you will certainly in one way or the other stay in a sort of a bubble, but that these algorithms that are now designed to show you what you want to hear, um, to have an obligation to, 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 in, to, to, for a rupture of this. Like, I don't know, how, how, there are different ways of doing it. I mean, you can either have an obligation to, to pour in WHO flagged, flagged uh, serious, um, um, I'm lacking the word information, uh, or you could have a, um, uh, an obligation to to show the opposite. Um, when when I had um, I had of course a lot of conversations with with responsibles of these of these tech companies, and Facebook I remember they told me that they when I when I when I brought this up they said that they already uh, included this in a very moderate way of course by by shifting the, um, the, um, the impact of uh, what you have liked previously. This, of course, is part of the algorithms. More to who you like, who your friends are, because this is much more diverse. You have your, your weird uncle and you have your neighbor who might have completely different opinions than you have in these friends. So shifting it from content to your personal environment already creates sort of more plurality. But do you think that this plurality aspect also is something, of course, not alone, but combined with transparency and information that would help? Shoshana, what's your take on that? And also the question of the referee, because it is very important. Well, you know, the, the, the free speech debate um, I think has been a way that democracy has sort of shot itself in the foot for many years now uh, because of a lack of understanding of what's of what is really going on behind the scenes. And um, and Sasha was certainly touching on this in her remarks. We're not talking about, you know, the, the idea of free speech, if we go, if we go back to uh, what was the original idea, the idea was that um, um, each citizen uh, has the opportunity to speak their mind. They cannot be um, uh, unilaterally um, and, um, and um, you know, uh, without reason uh, censored or silenced by their government. Uh, and that the concept, certainly in the, in the American Bill of Rights, the concept is very much a concept of imagining a, uh, a free and open public space, a public square. Uh, Habermas called it the, the, uh, the public sphere. Uh, and the idea that in an open public sphere, uh, uh, ideas will rise and fall ultimately based on their merit. And therefore, in this public square of free speech is consistent with a viable society because a viable society needs a normal distribution. It needs norms that are at the center. And most people in the society, the great majority of people in the society uh, understand and agree to and adhere to those norms. And so they dominate the center. There are uh, differences of opinion on many things, uh, but where those differences become fringe, where they become uh, real deviations from the norms, they naturally in a public square will congregate around the margins, not at the center. This is the only way that society, any society, 
can exist. Uh, without that, I mean, imagine something as simple as traffic. Every time you're, you're driving your car, you get to an intersection and there's a red light. You don't have to get out of your car, pull your gun or your knife uh, and go into the intersection and start fighting everyone else for who gets to come and go. <laughs> you don't even have to get out and start shouting. In an orderly society, which we mostly have, uh, everybody agrees that red means stop and green means go. And uh, there aren't enough police in the world to enforce this at every single traffic light. This is how we have society. Um, I think of it like um, auto racing. Some people love auto racing, like NASCAR racing. You go to a track and you watch uh, cars going insanely fast. <laughs> and, and some people love that and they think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's art, it's skill, it's amazing. Speed has its own kind of beauty. But does anybody want NASCAR racing in the neighborhood? <laughs> no. In the neighborhood, you want your red lights and you want everybody to go, you know, in an orderly way that we all agree to. Well, what Sasha is describing and what the what the research of uh, of um, of her of her institute has uh, has shown uh, in many different cases is that what is specifically happening in a place like Facebook, for example, is that the NASCAR racing is being artificially, this is not natural selection, it's unnatural selection, it's being artificially driven to the neighborhood, to the center, what should be at the margins is being driven to the center and it makes the center unlivable, it makes the center chaos. Why is that happening? It's happening again. If you remember one thing from what I've said today, it's happening because of economics, because crazy stuff draws more engagement. Engagement is not the end game. The end game is extraction. The more engagement, the more time, opportunity, what information scientists call attack surface, the more attack surface there is, for us to draw out the behavioral data that becomes our private property that we use for all of our downstream processes of commercialization. Okay, so, um, so we are at the mercy, not, we're not in a public sphere, we're in a private sphere, we're in a private square owned and operated by surveillance capital. That's where we are today. There is no free speech in this private square. It's what Facebook wants to vault to the center for the sake of its own revenue streams. That's where we live today. So if we don't act on this as Democrats and understand Democrats, small d, of course, and understand that the only way we will ever have free speech again is to interrupt and outlaw these um, mechanisms of private capital in order to reclaim that beach looking out at the ocean and the horizon that I was talking about, you know, some relatively free space where once again, uh, truth more or less rises to the top, good ideas more or less rise, rise to the top and the pernicious, the hateful, the downright organized disinformation campaigns of deceit that are intended to unravel the social fabric, those naturally fall to the fringe where they belong. And it's not that we don't treat them, we deal with them, we have laws and sanctions and we deal with them, but we deal with them at the fringe. They're not on Capitol Hill uh, 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 fueling a political coup. So this is where we are right now. And we need our lawmakers to understand this. Um, perhaps just the last thing I'll say is, it's not a question of, you know, now we have censorship by the private market and so let's switch to censorship by the state. It's a question of the state, which is to say the democratic state. I'm not talking about Duterte, for example. You know, I'm not, I'm not talking about the autocratic state, I'm talking about democracies. 
it's essential for democracies to use law and to use new rights to clear the space, to give us back a free space where we don't have to have censorship, where we have that natural play, the natural selection uh, of the best ideas and the, and the best information, not those, um, what was it, the 34 websites that got uh, multiples of, uh, of Facebook visits, whereas no one was going to get the good information from the WHO and the CDC. Uh, that would not happen if we had democratic laws outlawing um, the imperatives and the algorithmics that derive from them, clearing the space so that once again, the good information rises and the corrupt information falls. Sasha, we got a very interesting question from my colleague, Malta Fisher. He's asking, would it make a difference if we established a law giving us the ownership of our data? Would that make a big change? I mean, would it change things? No. I, mean, <laughs> I think that the, the, the fundamental issue here is having regulated oversight, democratic oversight of the processes that we've just talked about. It ultimately comes down to that which isn't so different from, of course, what we do in relation to other industries. Um, and so it shouldn't be such a stretch of the imagination. Um, what we've really seen in the recent period is a sort of fringe insurgency, exactly what Shoshana said. We've called it the fringe insurgency. We've seen those groups and ideas and movements that ultimately people believed to be small scale fringe grouplets. Um, mainstream themselves, mainstream themselves, normalize themselves successfully um, with a systemic uh, impact on our democratic civic culture. Um, this question of organic versus inorganic, that has to be applied to this uh, dichotomy that's often presented around speech and censorship. Speech I think is only really to be called speech if it is in fact organic. If it is inorganically amplified and targeted, that's not really what we mean by it. And ultimately we need a regulatory um, system that levels the playing field again for speech where good can outcompete bad ideas. Just as Shoshana said, we set about trying to do just that at the outset with our work on extremism and, and indeed, indeed terrorist content, sort of interestingly mobilizing civil society in this space out, you know, to outcompete bad with good. And what we realized quite quickly is that um, the cards were stacked against us, that it was never gonna quite work. And it was for these reasons. Number one, that bad actors deploy bad behaviors online, you know, your bots and your, you know, they game the system, fakery of all kinds. And secondly, that the system itself tilts in the interest of extreme messaging. Mainstreamed extremism is a systemic threat to democracy long-term. We have to know it. This is not the public square, it's the private square that we're talking about, but we need a public square. In, in the German elections in 2017, we found that by and large, voters voting for mainstream parties were still imbibing mainstream media. And those that were voting AfD were almost exclusively imbibing their information from an alternative media ecosystem largely online. That, that information segregation and fragmentation that we're seeing is undermining the public square. It has a huge set of implications. So for me, it's not about necessarily your data ownership, although I like the idea of having absolutely a system that gives you back more control over how your data is utilized but that system needs to be one um, of transparency, as I've said, across the policies, processes and outcomes of these platforms. Thank you very much. We're running out of time. So I'm asking that um, the two panelists I'm going to address now to be extremely brief. Katerina Bardi, how soon do you think uh, will we have a, a, a DSA and a DMA that are sort of uh, approved by uh, all the relevant actors in Brussels and then Shoshana, Will that be quick enough? Literally just giving me a date and then a quick response. 
Well, if we see that GDPR, which was a big step, I think, uh, I think it took six years. Um, I believe it will be shorter than that. Um, but uh, we have just started the discussion with the Commission. So it will take a, a couple of years, I would say. Susanna, is that, is that quick enough? You were so optimistic about Europe. Is it quick enough? Look, I, I think if, um, you know, we're, we're also seeing um, in, in France and in Germany, a discussion about pre-implementation of some of the critical pieces, uh, the, the DMA in Germany, the DSA in France, uh, I think that will go a long way toward accelerating this process and signaling to the companies, uh, to our citizens and to the world uh, that, that these changes are really going to occur. Um, and I think, uh, you know, a, a year or two for deliberation and actually making sure that we fund these uh, new pieces of legislation, not only with ample financial resources, but with the scientific resources and the human resources that we're going to need from all the participating countries uh, for these auditing um, operations that are going to be so critical and for the new public authorities that are going to be vested, uh, that are going to be so critical. Um, uh, I think a, a couple of years is, is reasonable. The third decade, we're in the third decade. This is essential. If we, if we limp to the end of this decade without decisive action, finding our way back is going to be more difficult, much more difficult, more violent, uh, more fraught, uh, and, um, and uh, far more unequal playing field. So time is of the essence, um, but it's also democracy and we love democracy. <laughs> yes, indeed, time of the, is of the essence. And also I see Christine is already waiting uh, for us to wrap up. I'd like to thank all my lovely panelists. I think this was my first ever all female panel. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for your insightful contributions. I think this is a discussion that we should follow up on soon. Um, because it's just extremely relevant and uh, it cannot be stressed enough. Christine, over to you.